Hello, I'm Sarah Sharp. Am I on? Uh, yes. Hello, I'm Sarah Sharp. Uh, I'm a Linux kernel hacker as my day job. And I want to say up front that I've never designed a GUI before, unless you count really bad ones in Shell. <laughs> I'm also a gardener. And some people might say, how can you be a hacker and also be a gardener? Because isn't gardening like all these tedious, repetitious tasks over and over and over again? But I think most hackers will agree that repetitious tasks are good if they're a mind-clearing exercise, or you learn something from them, or the produce is somehow better of the, uh, the repetitious tasks versus, versus the actual automated tasks. Like maybe your tomatoes taste a whole lot better. So for me, gardening really is a chance to learn. I get to learn about plants and chemical reactions and photosynthesis and climate change, although if you've been in Queensland, you've probably had enough climate change in the last month. So for me, if I go on vacation to give a talk at a conference in France in summer and my lettuce starts flowering, I don't like get sad because I can't eat my lettuce. I say, holy crap, that's how lettuce reproduces. Isn't that freaking cool? <laughs> but I'm still a lazy hacker. If I could find a way to actually automatically get rid of weeds, I would. Although maybe that's a talk for next year. <laughs> So instead, I'll talk about some tools that uh, I have some projects I've been working on this year. Uh, one of the projects is a uh, open source uh, calendaring tool to help gardeners plan their plantings and transplantings and, and uh, when, basically when to start their seedlings. The other project I've been working on is a small Android application called Cold Snap. And it actually will automatically uh, let you know when there's going to be a cold spell or a frost in your area. And the, the other project I'm going to talk about is the Garduino, which is an, an, uh, an Arduino-based board to automatically water your plants based on soil moisture sensors. So the first problem that a lot of gardeners face is the scheduling problem. And contrary to popular belief, gardening doesn't begin in the spring when things start to get warm. It actually begins early in winter when you start to receive these nice glossy seed catalogs. And you start looking through the pages and saying, wouldn't it be cool if I could grow some purple carrots this year? And don't those orange cauliflowers look really neat? And so you end up buying a few seed packets, and then you go to seed exchanges and get a couple more, and then you find your stash down in the basement from last year. And by that time, you've got about 30 different plants that you want to plant. So the traditional gardener would sit down with their paper calendar, and they'd figure out their, their last frost date. In, in places of the world that are not tropical, we actually do have frosts. And in Oregon, the, the last frost date is around April. So your seed packets say things like, start your seeds indoors six to eight weeks before your last frost date. So you mark that on your calendar. And then it says things like, um, uh, transplant your seeds indoors once the true leaves show up. So the seedling will come out of the ground and it will have little baby leaves and then it will grow leaves that look a little bit more well formed. And that's when you're supposed to transplant it. Um, so you mark that on your calendar. And then perhaps you, you mark the date where you want to start taking the seeds outside, getting them used to the temperature, and then bringing them inside at night. That usually happens about three days before you plant them outside. So you've got this all planned out. And then you discover your sister's birthday is on the last frost date, and she wants to go away for the weekend. And suddenly all of your planning is completely bogus in the air. And you know a normal person would sit down and print out another paper calendar. Um, but I'm a hacker, so I wrote a garden tool instead. So it's about um, 900 lines of C. It's kind of an object-oriented representation of plants. Um, and I ran it through Valgrind. It, it doesn't leak memory or anything, which is cool for being a user space tool written in C. Um, and, uh, like, I'm, and as I said, I'm not a GUI designer. 
So the, the tool currently takes a comma-separated uh, value uh, file as its is input. And uh, there's like 11 magic fields. And I wanted to make it sort of uh, versatile. So I wanted you to be able to um, say, I want to start my plants indoors. Or maybe instead you want to just buy your plants from a nursery and then you know, separate them later. Or maybe you want to directly sow your carrot seeds into the ground and then thin them out later. So basically the tool will take all of those three different use cases in and allow you to put all three of them uh, tasks onto your calendar. So I started this little calendaring tool right after the last LCA. And I got it to output some nice plain text um, about March 7th, which was about a week before I, a week after I was supposed to start planting seeds. So it was maybe a little bit late, but not too late. The, and it worked pretty well. I was able to actually start my, my nice tomato plants inside under my grow lamp and actually have an idea of when I should start them so that they'll be ready to be transplanted outside. Um, I did find out that on the seed packets it will say, you know, these seeds have an 85% chance of germination. And so I kind of made the tool to say how many seeds you need to plant to, in order to get one plant. And it turns out the seed, optim seed germination rates are completely bogus. And you should just plant like five for every one that you want to actually get. It gets even worse if the seeds are, are smaller. Um, the problem with this nice plain text output was that I stuck it on a wall and I forgot about it. Um, there was really no integration with other calendaring tools, and I really wanted to be able to look at my calendar and say, oh, I need to plant things rather than go out drinking or, or whatever. So I decided that I wanted to have it integrate with Google Calendar. And so I wanted it, the tool to output, instead of plain text, output uh, iCalendar. Now, the, the problem is... Um, the iCal are, um, specification, RFC 2445. Um, it's a giant specification. There's not very good examples. And all of the tools out there, all of the calendaring tools, um, kind of accept a little bit munged inputs, depending on what you give them. Um, one of my uh, friends in Portland who works on Caligator, which is the open source tool that handles uh, the Portland technical calendar, his quote about iCal was that it's like an old cranky cat that pees behind your sofa. So it's not very fun to work with iCal. But I did finally get Google Calendar to actually take my iCal input. I put my iCal file up on my server and I imported the URL and I could actually see my, my tasks that I needed to do. And so now I could see, oh, instead of going out to dinner with Fred, I should actually go and, and plant, plant some seeds instead. Um, the problem with actually having Google Calendar look at the URL and this was a bug that I had actually discovered about two or three years ago, and it's still not fixed. Google only updates iCalendar files once a day. So if you want to sit there and tweak your schedule, you have to wait a whole day for it to update. You can kind of work around this by adding a little PHP script that like changes the URL name, just slightly adds random numbers to the end and stuff like that. But the user has to re-import re the calendar every time. So it wasn't very good. It, it worked, sort of worked, but wasn't ideal. And what I actually found was that instead of having the, the calendar, you know, inputting into my calendar was good for initially planning my my garden year and figuring out, oh, I'm going to be at a conference. Then I don't want to have my uh, broccoli start being ready to harvest because then it will just flower before I get back from, from the conference. Um, but throughout the year, what would happen is I would go get, go off and hack on something, forget about my garden completely, and come back and say, oh, it's Saturday. I was supposed to plant stuff on Wednesday. I really want to shift all those dates. Um, so I really felt like it should be more of a to-do list and perhaps integrate with some uh, cloud tool like uh, Remember the Milk instead. Um, so that's kind of my, my um, to-do for, for the, the garden calendar. I'd also like to make some sort of nicer web front end so people don't have to figure out magic CSV files. <laughs> So 
So this brings us to um, late July. And the sun is shining, and my garden is wonderful. It's actually summer in the, the northern hemisphere in, in July. And um, I see the, the LCA call for papers. And I go, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I could talk about my open source gardening stuff? And I go, but you know, the calendaring app is not sexy. You know, what can I add to this to actually get them to accept my paper? And so I said, well, what if I made an Android application? And what if I did an Arduino thing? Wouldn't that be cool? And so I said, I have plenty of time. I can do this. You know, I got a whole half a year. And then November rolled around. <laughs> and I still really hadn't worked on either of the projects. And it was starting to get cold. And so I decided to actually do the, um, the Android project that was the cold snap, because I was starting to think about cold. Um, so the problem with cold is that frosts come in, in Oregon when the temperature drops below, you know, zero degrees Celsius. And the problem with frost is that when the water in the plant cells freeze, it actually expands and it ruins the walls of the plant cells. So your plant can actually lose all the moisture in its cells after the frost and then it will die from dehydration even though there's plenty of water coming in through its root systems. So gardeners deal with frost by raising the temperature that the plants are actually in. So they'll cover the plants up with plastic, or maybe they'll stick them in a greenhouse, and so that raises the air temperature so the plants don't freeze, even though everything around them is freezing. Now, the problem is, is that you need to know ahead of time when a frost is going to happen. Um, and I don't want to sit there and pull the weather website and figure out when the frost is going to come. I mean, that's just not a good use of my time. Instead, I'd like to have some device, like say my phone, tell me when there's actually going to be a frost coming. So as I said, polling versus interrupts, I'd rather have my phone interrupt me rather than me have to pull the weather websites. <laughs> So I looked around for the Android app because I didn't want to, you know, uh, redo the wheel. I, I said that I needed to, my hard requirements were, I needed to have an alert for frost, which it could alert for, for like colder temperatures, that would be fine. And the alert needed to happen that, at a good time that was, uh, would fit my needs. So most frosts happen at night. So I wanted to be notified in the early afternoon that I needed to cover my plants. Um, and I also kind of really wanted it to be an open source application because I wanted to be able to go hack on it if I needed to. So I found an application and it's called Weather Checker. Unfortunately, it's not open source and I said, nah, eh, that's fine. What the idea of Weather Checker is, is that they are trying to provide a way for when you wake up in the morning and you're like, blah, 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 what do I wear today? It will tell you, is it going to be warm or cold? warmer than average or colder than average. Um, and it worked pretty well, except it, it didn't quite meet some of the requirements that I had. Uh, the, the first problem was that it alerted too often for me. I didn't need to know every single morning what the weather was going to be like. I just needed to know if the temperature was going to be below a certain threshold. So I got really tired of waking up in the morning and going, why is my phone beeping at me again? Um, and it also alerted at the wrong time. It alerted in the morning. Since frosts happen at night, by the time I got the alert, well, my plants would be dead. Um, and I also had no idea how it calculated average temperature. So if I'm having, if we're having a slightly warmer spring, you know, warmer than average, is it going to tell me every morning, oh, it's warmer than average, and then not tell me when the temperature drops below into frost, which is normal for that time of year? Um, so I, I didn't know its internal guts of how it calculated the average temperature. So I decided that I was going to do it myself, which, you know, the, there be dragons. <laughs> um, so I started looking around for a good source of weather data. And I really like weather underground because um, it shows history, it has international data, and um, someone actually told me that uh, you can actually have your own weather station and upload it to Weather Underground and, and have that information there. And I thought, okay, that's really cool. It's got a well-documented API. Except that the API had this little clause to it. So 
So the, the data is there, it's just not fully open. And I wasn't happy with that. So I turned to some nice open government data instead. Um, in, in my country, we have a, a government agency called the National Oceanic uh, Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA for short. Um, and it will actually tell you uh, the weather predictions. It doesn't tell you history. It only works for the United States, and you have to enter your US postal zip code in order to get the information. Um, they have an interface uh, that uses SOAP um, that returns XML to you. I actually found later they have a RESTful interface, but I swear it wasn't there when I first looked at it. <laughs> Um, and so I did finally build my little Android app. And I have a movie that I can show you later if you're, you're interested in of it. Um, but basically, you, you enter your zip code. And you can fiddle with the minimum cold temperature that you want to be notified for. And then you hit OK. And it will transfer you to the next activity, which actually shows you the prediction for the next three days. So you can see I've set the, the minimum cold temperature to 45 degrees Fahrenheit, which is warmer than, than freezing, but maybe you've got something like, say, a banana tree that actually needs to get covered and is a little more delicate than some of your other plants. So we can see uh, 45 was when we wanted to be notified. 48 degrees is fine, and 41 and 40, and the, the Monday and Tuesday 41 temperatures are, are showing that it's cold. Right now, it doesn't actually give an alert. Um, I would like to change that, but this is about as far as I got. So it's showing real data, and it actually is, uh, is useful a little bit. So I, I have a, a brief code overview, but I'm just going to skim through it. Uh, basically, the, the code is all up on uh, GitHub if you search for Garden Geek, so you can look around and maybe use the slide to figure out exactly what's, what's going on. I, as I said, I still have some to-dos. I want to add the, a background test, uh, task. I'd also like it to notify for things like hail, because if you have plants outside and they're, they're little thin seedlings, if the hail comes there, it's going to completely break them in half. Um, so I want to be notified for hail, too. And, and luckily, Noah will just give me that data. And so um, I would like to expand this to other countries besides the United States. So if anyone knows of good, fully open uh, data, than, than weather data, then please tell me afterwards. So um, at this point, I know that a lot of people were really excited about the, the Arduino project. Because every time I talked with someone about my talk, they were like, oh yeah, you're talking about the Arduino stuff. <sighs> So the, the Arduino is, is the, the Garduino, gardening plus Arduino. Um, and it's supposed to automatically water your plants based on soil moisture. And there's a really good uh, tutorial up on Instructables.com on, on how to do this with your Android. And that picture is actually from Instructables.com too. So how it works is that it has a really, really cheap soil moisture sensor. I mean, this is dirt cheap. It's plaster of Paris and two galvanized nails, and some wires. And what actually happens is the plaster of Paris will absorb the moisture. Oh, by the way, this is all done in Inkscape. Thank you, Donna, for your lovely tutorial. Um, so the, the plaster of Paris actually absorbs the moisture in the soil that's around it. And it actually cha changes resistance a little bit. As um, it gets more moist, since uh, water is a good conductor of electricity, it will actually lower the resistance. And the, the voltage drop across uh, the wires will increase. So if it's completely dry, theoretically, um, you have no current flowing through the nails. Uh, resistance is infinite. And therefore, there's no voltage drop across it. So if it's dry, the voltage is going to be low. If it's wet, the voltage is going to be high across the two nails. And so I can hear you say, that's awesome. But did you build it? I'm actually quite sad to say that um, as of the end of 2010, I did not actually build the Garduino. But that brings me to New Year's Eve 2010. And Jamie's family, my, my husband, 
they, they like to have this little white elephant gift exchange every year. And I actually got a, a, a little gift. And if you can't tell what that is, that's a little fountain that's supposed to sit on your desk. And I kind of took it as a sign. I'm like, I gotta get this done. So the, uh, <laughs> I took it apart. And it's actually just a little battery pack and a, and a little pump. And it's a three volt battery pack. And I said, I have a five volt Arduino. I can totally power this off the Arduino. It'll, it'll totally work. So the night before I was going to leave for Australia, <laughs> I sat down and I started ripping it apart. And I started playing with it. And, uh, and so the first step was that I had to be able to tell when there was a voltage drop. When the, when the soil was getting uh, dry, you want the, the, the voltage will drop down. So I had to be able to measure that. And so I decided that I would uh, First, ignore the soil moisture completely, ignore the pump completely, and build a really simple circuit that actually uh, uses a variable resistor called a potentiometer, or a pot, affectionately known as. Um, and so when the voltage across the potentiometer dropped below a specific threshold, I was going to turn on a light. It's basically like the hello world of electronics. So I sat there, and I, I took my little potentiometer meter, and I turned it. And as you turn it, the, uh, the resistance actually changes. And as you, it's hard to tell, but you can actually see the LED is off in that picture, and it's on in that picture over there. So I was like, yes, I can blink some LEDs. This is awesome. And so next step was to actually, instead of turning on an LED, turn on the digital output. So you know, eventually that, that output's going to turn on the pump. When the when the voice when the voltage drops and the uh, the the soil is dry, so you can see that actually um, the the Arduino says that it will nominally put out five volts. It's actually putting out four point nine two volts. So the second step was that the Arduino will output that five volts, but the pump will take three volts. And so I said. Uh, I need uh, to convert that 5 volts to 3 volts. And so in my simplistic electronics 101 knowledge, I said, oh, I'll just build a voltage divider. And what a voltage divider does is it divides the, re the voltage across two resistors. And depending on the value of those resistors, you may have more voltage here or more, vo more voltage here. So I sat down and I measured the, uh, the, res the voltage, uh, the resistance of the pump. And I went, 8 ohms seems a little bit low. But I went with it, and um, <laughs> yes, I hear you electronics geeks muttering in there, shh, it's a surprise. Um, so I, I whipped out my, my electronics calculation, and I said, oh, yeah, series of equations, and, and Ohm's law, and I can figure this out, and it'll be, you know, I'll, I'll figure out the exact resistances that I need. And it was a complete failure. I actually sat down, and I had my nice little voltage divider in there. And I went, oh, well, the, the, pump, the light's on. I can see the light. So I must be outputting voltage. But the pump's not turning on. And I measured the voltage across the pump. And I went, why is that voltage 1.6 rather than 3? And I went, OK, maybe I, I did the resistors wrong. So I stuck some pots in there and, and started fiddling with things. And then I turned on the pump and measured the voltage actually coming out of the Arduino. And instead of being 5 volts, it was 2.43 volts. And I went, huh, that's weird, because when the pump's not there, I, I can measure the 5 volts coming out. And I went, OK, that's strange. But it was 4 in the morning, and I just plugged it in. And the pump just took the 4.3 volts just fine and turned on. And I, at that point, I was like, hell yeah, it works. <laughs> and I said, yes, I can pack this, and I can take it to LCA, and I can work on it before LCA. And so I, I very carefully put all my electronics in a little box, and I wrote a little note to the TSA saying, these are not bomb parts. Please don't confiscate these. <laughs> and, uh, and prayed that my check baggage would actually make it through. So on the plane, when I probably should have been sleeping, I sat and I thought about that weird voltage drop. I thought, why am I getting 2.43 volts instead of 5 volts? And I started looking at the data sheets. The thing is, is that the Arduino only can output a specific current. So it can only drive the pump with so much power. And the pump was actually trying to draw more current. 
And Ohm's law says that voltage equals current times resistance. Since the resistance of the pump was constant, and it wanted a specific amount of current, it was actually making the voltage from that output drop down to 4.3. So I was basically forcing the Arduino to do things that it really, really didn't want to do in order to run my pump. So I didn't really want to damage the Arduino, so I, I thought back to, to my basic electronics course, and I'm like, I need some sort of switch. I need some sort of switch to turn it on. I want to electrically separate um, the Arduino from the input. So, what I, so a, a relay is basically a switch. And you can see uh, the plus and minus there. When the voltage on the plus side is positive, a certain value, in this case 5 volts, then the switch on the other side between those two terminals on the right hand side will actually flip and it will be like it's connected. If the voltage on that plus terminal is zero, then that switch is flipped open and those terminals are not, are, are not connected. So basically, when the Arduino applies that five volts to the relay, then the battery, battery will actually turn on and power the pump. And so it's a nice electrically separate thing. It's like turning on and off a light switch, basically. Now, this was two days, so I landed in, in, in Australia, and I said, um, okay, I've got to find this relay. And um, a lot of the electronics folks know that if you walk into an electronics store, it's not, it's, they, they're there to sell cell phones. They're not there to sell analog electronics. And so I tried Dick Smith's, and I tried JB Hi-Fi, and they all said, what the heck, really? What are you talking about? It gave me that look like. And they all told me, go look at J-Car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I wandered into J-Car, and I was like, why don't we have one of these in Portland? <laughs> And I found my relay, and I found some wacky USB devices, and all sorts of other things that I probably shouldn't have bought, but I bought them anyway, because it was cool. <laughs> and so I also went and found an art store, because to make my soil moisture sensors, I needed this Plaster of Paris. Plaster of Paris is this lovely, fine, gray powder. And that's not exactly something you want to bring over in an airplane with you. <laughs> So I found an art store that wasn't underwater, got my plaster of Paris. I already had brought my galvanized nails over, which I don't know how those made it through. And so the next step was to actually build my soil moisture sensors. So I sat down and I propped up the legs of my rickety table on the balcony of the backpackers that I was staying at. You can see the styrofoam in the bottom of the legs. And I uh, started to build my soil moisture sensors. And basically you take a little, um, a little uh, tube, and you can kind of see that on the picture over there. It's a, it's a little um, plastic tube, and you just pour the plaster of Paris mixture in there, and then you just kind of slide the nails into it, and the nails are, are sitting in some wax paper, and they just kind of rest on the little tube, and, and then the plaster of Paris dries, and you can actually use that as your soil moisture sensor, and it's like, you know, five cents to make. Um, so I did have to calibrate the system. You know, when I sat there with my little potentiometer and I twiddled it, I was actually reacting. Well, the problem is, is that the soil moisture sensor takes a while to absorb the moisture. And so it's going to take a while to react. So if you're trying to turn on when the voltage drops below a specific threshold, and then wait until that, that voltage rises again, you're going to actually sit there and water your plant for five minutes while the, the moisture gets absorbed into the plaster of Paris. So I wrote a little Arduino code that actually just sits there and says, OK, you know, I'm, I, it's time to water the plant, because the voltage has dropped. And I measure that. And then it will water it for five seconds. It will uh, return out of that function. And then it won't water it again for a specified amount of time. So it will only water every, say, 30 seconds, even if the, the pot is really dry. And you could expand upon this. You could say, like, you know, you have a, a light sensor on your Arduino board, and you only want to water during the, the evening or the morning hours. So maybe you want to calibrate it so that it only waters then. So that, that's sort of a, an application that you could uh, actually do with this. 
Um, now, you, I did have to munch it a little bit because the Arduino doesn't have a real-time clock. It doesn't have an idea of, you know, like, oh, it's 6 p.m. On, on Saturday. It only has an idea that it's so many milliseconds since it started. So I, I kind of worked around that a little bit. And it was really simple code. It's only about 80 lines, um, and it's got comments. So it's, it's not that bad. Step eight, light things on fire. I mean, <laughs> play with heat shrink on my balcony. Um, I was concerned about the connections between the battery system and the pump system, because the pump's going to sit in water. And when I ripped the pump out of the, the little fountain, the wires were pretty short. They were about like this short. And I wanted to run longer wires. So I had a connection. So I wanted to, to secure that connection. And heat shrink, you basically slide it over the two wires, and it's a little tube. And then you apply a little heat, and the, it shrinks down to the, the connection. Um, so I sat there with my little barbecue lighter that I'd gotten from the store and um, made heat, heat shrink. It was my first time doing it, and um, I kind of burned the wires on either side of the heat shrink, so it's not very secure at all. <laughs> but it was fun anyway, lighting things on fire. Um, and the day before LCIA, I went out to uh, two stores and got uh, the various things that I needed. No, not the dress, the plants. <laughs> And I actually have a demo for you guys. So I have the Arduino um, hooked up right now. And this is the final system. So you can see the Arduino over here. It's actually connected via USB to my computer. Um, if you had it in your garden, you could just have, you know, batteries or a wall ward or something like that. It doesn't have to be hooked up over USB. And that big black bit is actually the relay that I got from JCAR. There's a resistor in there, and basically it's just a bunch of wires. That's the battery pack over there. It's currently off because uh, I didn't want it watering the plant while I was giving the talk. So, this is Minicom output. And you can see that there's voltage over here. Um, it's, uh, the, the top part is 100 and, uh, 1,023. So that voltage measured is actually uh, half of that value. So the, the plant is a little dry. Um, and that's a countdown. So it's going to only water every 30 seconds. So that's a, a countdown. Um, and and remember that the, the battery pack is currently off, so it's, it's not going to water right now. But I have a little plant cam for you guys. <laughs> so uh, this, the, the blob that you see with the red and green wires coming out is actually the soil moisture sensor in that pot. And that's what it's measuring over there, that, that 589. And then that uh, big blue thing is, uh, it's hard to see, but it's actually a watering pot. And I've got my little pump in there, and I'm going to actually water the plant. So let's see, we've got four seconds to go. Let's turn it on. Zero. So, that is my lovely demo. I hope that it demonstrates that you too can hack together electronics in a week. <laughs>fair bit of time for questions, so put your hand up, I'll bring the mic up to you. Oh, you can come up afterwards, it's hidden behind the podium because I wanted it to be a surprise. <laughs> Sarah, I just hope yes. you don't uh, wear any of that stuff around you as you get back on the plane because that looked exactly like a Semtex bomb to me. <laughs> No, I'll put everything in a little box. I won't take it on with a, on the plane with me. Oh, yes, um, if anyone wants to take a plant home with them, I can't take that home either. Yeah, I... I, I oh, okay, I'll bring it tonight to the, uh, the, the geek dinner so someone can have the plant this evening. I had a question, actually. Yes. It was about the Plaster Paris sensors. How do they work with all different types of soils? Do you have to calibrate them differently for... Different so, types of soils. Right. So the question was about the, the plaster of Paris uh, soil. 
that sensors, um, does it work for, for all types of uh, soil? And you do have to calibrate it a bit. So the, the soil may be, say, more clay or maybe a little bit more sandy. And so you have to figure out you know, what voltage makes sense for that particular soil. What's, what's the baseline? Okay. But it will work for all types of soil. And can you do little ones for like little seedling trays and things like that? Or do you have to really have like a big plant in a pot like that? Um, I, I would think that for seedling trays, probably you know that they're going to be yeah. watered once a day, so you could just set up a just timer for that. Like going away or yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Slightly more comment than question. I think this is great for our usually drought affected country because you can be so careful with the water. I think it's just awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Um, just having a look at this, you seem to have the update rate on that particularly high. Is there any reason that you've got it updating that fast, or are you just doing it as fast as the, the Arduino can handle? So, so I'm updating, and I think it's every um, 100 milliseconds or so. It was really just for the demo. You could update, say, once an hour if you wanted to. Mm. You know, even set a timer and make the whole system go to sleep. This was just for the demo. Yeah. What does the future hold for the project? What's next? Uh, next, I, you know, it's been so fun to come to LCA because I get to talk with so many people that are, are like, oh, have you done this? Or I've actually done some automation myself. And so for the project, um, I would actually like to incorporate a little bit more sensors into the system. So I'd like to have a, a light sensor so that I can uh, tr actually track the light in my backyard. I'd like to have a soil temperature sensor on there so it can say, oh, the soil's reached uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It's time to plant your carrot seeds. And so I'd actually like to make a little custom Arduino shield that actually has those sensors on it and sell it as a project. But we'll see how that goes. I'll talk with, with John about that. Do they have a um, pH sensor? Oh, yeah, Arduino? maybe a pH sensor would be good, too. Uh, after the talk, people can come up and have a little look. Um, I'll just sorry. So let's thank you, Sarah, for the talk today. This is a small gift uh, made of macadamia, uh, recycled macadamia that you might have seen already. I, I'll probably plant something in it. Yeah, very good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.